Hi, I'm Pui with Office of Historic Preservation, and we're back with a very special episode of Historic Reservations. May is Historic Preservation Month, but also Asian American Heritage Month. And what better way to celebrate than to share a meal at Best Quality Daughter, a Asian contemporary joint that first opened here in November 2020 at the Historic Pearl, housed out of a folk Victorian house built by the Mueller family in circa 1906. But don't take it from me, we're gonna have a food tour and a walking tour of the building with Chef Jennifer Doberton and architect Vicky Yuan of Lake Plato. So let's take it off. Hi, hello. I am uh, Jennifer Doberton. I am one of the chefs and partners here at Best Quality Daughter. My, my good friend Vicky Yuan, she um, is the interior designer of Best Quality Daughter, as well as an architect at Lake Plato. Um, and we're here to give you a little tour of the building and talk about some of the food. Um, and we're going to start right here on our front porch. Great. So, yeah, this building was first restored by the Pearl in 2012 for the restaurant Granary, but as we mentioned, it, it was actually built in 1906. So, all of these columns and structure, siding, and even windows are like nearly 115 years old. When we renovated it last year, we decided to bring back color to the facade, which is very characteristic of these Queen's, Queen Anne. Um, style homes, and we worked with uh, local colorist Jim Smith to select historically appropriate colors that were also very in keeping with the best quality daughter identity, very feminine. And what's really nice about using the color is that it highlights these um, ornate details on the building, like these Corinthian capitals, uh, which is a little touch of pink. Um, for the front porch, we have we introduced some uh, new lighting that's both modern and vintage, and we have little uh, custom stencils throughout the, the building. Let's get inside. So when you first walk in, the, this is the entry vestibule and we kind of decided to leave it as we found it, which was um, for the greenery, they kind of stripped it down to the structure and kind of exposed the original wood wainscoting and kept the original transoms above the doors. Um, we really liked the, kind of preserving this room um, and the scale of this room. And every addition that we made, like these um, cane screen dividers, we very carefully set them inside of these openings so that we were respecting the architecture. Um, the two kind of primary elements in this space are this chandelier and this modern host stand. Um, that features artist and Best Quality Daughter kind of founding member Jennifer McDasha. Um, and this is her installation of custom um, ceramic ribbons. And the ribbons are uh, cast out of different, out of the different shades of porcelain doll colors. So it's like a representation of how we are all kind of different colors. So. Moving into the bar. Um, we, you can start to see that every room in the house has an identity and a different kind of theme. Um, and we really liked, uh, or we really were inspired by the original layout of the house and wanted to keep that kind of residential small scale feel. Um, so we inserted the bar at the very front to kind of welcome you into the space. Yeah. We were careful to work around the architecture. Jen, do you want to talk about this neon sign? Yeah, we were kind of gripping over what to make as the neon sign right there and we ended up going with the double happiness symbol which is kind of ubiquitous across Asia and it's um, at a lot of weddings and you see it on a lot of like Asian branding especially Chinese branding but it is um, it's super auspicious and it means double happiness so that's what that neon sign is. Um, I think the, the prize in this room is this custom wallpaper that our graphic designer Jamie Stolarski designed and it's of uh, San Antonio iconic establishments. Um, there's kind of a weird wears Waldo element to it. So if you look really closely, you can see things like there's the Spurs Coyote right there. Um, at Randy's, if you look in very fine print, it says sex pistols in Texas one night only. Um, you should Google that story. <laughs> um, and then there's like there's like a, there's chocolas and little conchas and stuff. You just kind of have to look for it. 
But yeah, it's a fun, a fun wallpaper. And currently, we're the only place in the world that has it. The other fun element in this room is the pink mirror acrylic ceiling. That's kind of a play on an antique mirror ceiling. I guess it makes the space feel a little bit bigger because it's a tiny, tiny room. So moving into the main dining room, um, this is a space that we made the most kind of, we opened it up and um, thought it'd be fun to do these poppy shaped frames around the pendants to kind of unify the space, but also kind of activate it. Um, the granary back in 2012 added a kitchen behind that wall. Um, and we, in our renovation, decided to bring back the original windows that were on the facade before the kitchen addition. And so, and use kind of mirror, kind of, since the kitchen's behind it. So it kind of gives you the feel of the original space. And we added a window too, right? On this yeah, side? So. Yeah. So, and then again, this is all art that was, is either pieces by Jennifer Dodchuk or curated by Jennifer Dodchuk. And they're all Asian American. Yeah. And then um, the girl or woman slash friend that did all the upholstery and um, all of the soft finishes is also one of like a good friend of mine from childhood. So it was also super fun to be able to do this project with my like my friends and especially my friends that are women. So it was, it was really, yeah, yeah, a lot of women. On this There's a lot of women on. This. <laughs> Um, and it was really important to us when we designed it. Um, at like really traditional Chinese restaurants, you can get private dining and private events. So we wanted to make sure that every room could be structured in a way where it felt like its own room separated from the other room. And so that's what these curtains are. So every dining room can be separated um, from the other rooms. So you can have private So that was also kind of on the like nod to a traditional like dim sum restaurant or like Chinese banquet hall. <laughs> so basically it is a very small kitchen for the amount of seats that this restaurant has. So it's very cramped, like it's it's very indicative of like a big city kitchen like that you would find in like New York or something where every square inch is pretty every square foot is pretty utilized and I so this is our very small kitchen. This is in addition to the building, yes, and that is, it used to be the pit smoker back there where the um, barbecue was the barbecue place, and we pushed this out and made it a, a walk-in. So this is a side porch that when it was a barbecue restaurant, it was a kind of open uh, porch that they added and they were very careful to kind of respect the existing tree in place. So that's why when we closed it in to make it into a dining room, but we kept that, that uh, cut into the building to keep that tree alive. Um, and we really liked the quality, the sort of very airy greenhouse-like quality so of, of the original porch. So we kind of kept it that way. And, um, used a different color scheme, and then we found these really fun uh, 1960s German sort of Sputnik pendants to march down the space. And again, there's more art on the wall. This is actually one of Jennifer's pieces, Jennifer Dodchuk, um, and that is me and Jennifer Dodchuk, and um, we are holding some of her ceramic pieces on the, if you look close, they say grill power and they're brick part purses that she fired. And I want to get this correctly and it might be wrong, but I'm like old boyfriend's t-shirts and like some of her grandmother's like, um, like possessions, clothing, I don't remember, but they're made to unclasp because it turned into a brick. So if you needed a brick to throw. Uh, <laughs> very useful. Uh, 
And then same over here, this is actually my mom at the Japanese Tea Gardens in San Antonio, um, which also has kind of a dark history um, in San Antonio's, or in the Asian history of San Antonio. And, but I thought that was a cool photo of her in the 70s before I was born at the Japanese Tea Gardens. And this is my mom as a small girl um, with my uncle and my grandparents in Taiwan. And of course, you need to have your money trees. So yeah, this is the, the booth room. It's kind of the movie dining space. And um, the signature feature of this room is this existing sort of uh, Woodward um, original archway that the celebrated kind of added our complimentary detailing to. Um, we really uh, wanted to do... Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, the booths... Um, well, why don't you say it? Um, it was important to us to have booths in the restaurant because they didn't think that booths are ubiquitous to like a Chinese American restaurant. So this is our, our ode to that as well. It's a small house, so that's basically the basically the end of the tour, but we're happy to share some food with you next if you'd like. Wow, thank you guys so much for uh, an amazing tour. We found out all about the intricacies of the building, some things that we didn't know even on my basic research from the, the documents that I had back at the Office of Historic Preservation. But now, we're bringing the second part of the tour, which is obviously the food. Uh, San Antonio is not only a, uh, a UNESCO creative city for gastronomy, but it's also uh, vernacularly known for its food culture that's not documented in you know fancy uh, fancy history books and whatnot. There's food stalls and high end and low end restaurants and everything in between. Um, and we're we're excited to have one that's housed out of the historic house. So with that being said, uh, tell us what kind of what kind of food comes to your mind at your menu when you first developed this uh, this restaurant out of a historic home. So um, it's a great question. The food concept has always been, I always wanted the food to represent um, basically myself and therefore my authentic self because there is like the question of, of authenticity when it comes to Asian food. And so my background is I am half Chinese, my mom is from Taiwan. Her parents um, fled the mainland during the Chinese Civil War in the late 40s, 1946. And um, she grew up in Taipei. She got married young and moved to the States. Um, and so I grew up in a like mixed race family where, and we owned a restaurant and it was like an American diner. So it was like, Growing up in San Antonio, Texas, with a Chinese mom, um, as a restaurant kid, but our restaurant wasn't like the traditional like Chinese American restaurant. Um, eating like American diner food, but then in the back eating Chinese food, and then like spending my summers going to Taiwan. Um, my grandfather was a chef. My uncle was a chef in Taiwan. So it's like kind of like in my DNA. And so it's like going to Taiwan, spending the summers there. And then after college, I uh, moved to Southeast Asia for about six years. So there's a lot of Southeast Asian food in my, in my like influence in my food. So it's kind of, the food is like a representation of that. There's a lot of Chinese flavors. There's a lot of Southeast Asian flavors. And then there's a lot of like South Texas, um, South Texas flavors as well. So, well, you know, part of Asian culture is not letting food waste, right? So, right. do you mind if I dig in? Yeah, go for it. All right, so what do we have here? Sure, so this is a Taiwanese salt and Taiwanese styled um, shiitake, Taiwanese fried shiitake, there you go. So, um, they're marinated shiitakes that we um, dust in the, in 
sweet potato flour. Um, sweet potato flour, Taiwan is super famous for um, Taiwanese fried chicken. It's a street food. Um, it has like a kind of a different crunch to it, I think, than like normally, normal, than like westernized um, fried foods. It's like a little bit crispier and airier. And that secret ingredient is sweet potato starch. Mm. Uh, not potato starch, sweet potato starch. It's sometimes hard to find and sometimes we run out of. Um, so that is what these are. And we wanted to stick to shiitakes. And that is kind of a nod to fried mushrooms in the south. So we want to do fried mushrooms in the south because it's one of my one of my favorite foods are fried mushrooms from gyms. Um, <laughs> so that's the Tex-Mex part. So that's the Tex-Mex <laughs> part, yeah. And then um, out of the Thai basil yogurt, because traditionally in Taiwan, you would get this dish with deep fried Thai basil. And we wanted to make that kind of like a lighter dipping sauce to kind of cut the, the like saltiness of the mushroom. Wow. And what's what's the red stuff on top? That is Korean chili thread. So oh, wow. that is garnished, but also edible. And it just kind of tastes like a, a nutty, um, smoky fried, fried chili. Yeah. So uh, with all this food, like Vicky, did, did she have you eat stuff off the menu to be inspired? Or? Yes, it was a, <laughs> definitely a perk of being on the design team is that we got to do be, be part of these tasting tasting sessions and, and try out different things. So how do you think um, the the task to design the interior spaces and a little bit of the exterior falls into curating an experience with with your mouth and with the, with the people that you're with and then the space or space around you like how did you navigate that? yeah i think well one thing that jen pointed out very early on when we started designing uh, was that she really wanted the restaurant to feel to be as accessible and sort of a, a place uh, that was sort of um, welcoming and you know not this sort of stuffy fine dining formal experience which we had been talking about you know the aesthetics of the place and the mood but I thought, I, I love that it's an elevated experience for sure, but it's also very accessible. And so the interiors design, I think, also tries to capture that, that sense of it's, it's sort of, it's modern, it's elegant, it's, um, but it's also playful and it's, it's kind of uh, an everyday place. Um, so I think that was a fun balance that, that is consistent through the food and the interiors. Wow. So what about the shrimp? That is just classic salt and pepper um, shrimp. I think this is one of my favorite dishes that exists of all time. And I, so it was important for me to just have like my favorite dishes on the menu. And I'm sure that there is a version of this in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, it comes shell on, which sometimes people um, want to fight me on and I refuse to change. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that I, I don't know an Asian culture or like an Asian country that doesn't have a version of salt and pepper shrimp and I think they're all delicious so this is just a straight up very traditional salt and pepper shrimp um, the only thing that might be a little bit different is we have a tomka remoulade for dipping sauce and that's also like our a nod to like southeast Asian flavors with the with the tomka um, like with the tomka flavor profile but then also we wanted to have um, the remoulade which is like a nod to like southern flavor too. Yeah, so in, so in Vietnam it's just called salty shrimp. I think it's a yeah. correct translation. <laughs> and uh, my mom would make it only on special occasions, like if it was my birthday and she'll make it for me. So like how do you think creating a special occasion meal for like everyday dining, how how does that play into your decision making creating that menu? Yeah, we wanted to have some special we wanted to have some dishes on the menu that were like like more luxurious and this is definitely one of them um we also have a salt and pepper crab on the menu right now there's a global crab <laughs> shortage that's like for a different episode on a different show um there's like a, a covid triggered global crab shortage right oh, wow. now um but but this was definitely one of them because i do think it's like a special dish that you usually only get on special occasions like when i eat this dish it's with my mom and it's when we're at like a dim when we're in some Chinatown which doesn't exist in San Antonio and it's at a dim sum place or something like that and you order off menu and it's most of the time we get salt and pepper crab and it's us picking the crab out of the tank mm -hmm. and then it coming yeah. and like and then serving it like full and just like kind of butchered up um so this is a nod to that yeah we Ricky and I did talk about how like we wanted to have some traditional like Chinese American um 
nods in this restaurant, and one of them was, it would be so cool if we just had, like, aquariums. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. And big screen televisions. Oh, man, I used to, I used to, I used to have them at, at, like, buffets and yeah. those, those yeah. big tables with the, uh, the Lazy Susan. In the yeah, that's right. Sure. So you guys brought a lot uh, about, you know, authenticity in your decision making. Um, so as, you know, Asian American women, how do you navigate Asian and American spaces and, and food, right? Um, you know, is everything that you do by virtue Asian food or Asian architecture? Are there elements that you downplay or highlight to bring out that authentic authenticity? That's a big question. It is a big question. I think Jen said it earlier where, you know, we wanted to be subtle about the references. And I think in this space, um, yeah, we're, we're so much more layered than, than that that sort of single identity, I think. And so this, this space kind of captures that uh, it's, it's a layering of lots of different influences of our lives. There's, there's um, sort of European influences here. There's Asian influences, certainly. But then there's um, modern, vintage. Um, there's a celebration of different colors and patterns. And it's, just, it's kind of a, a, a very maximalist approach, but a, a very inclusive one that kind of creates this sort of unique um, style out of it, um, and I think that kind of embraces kind of our idea of an Asian American identity. Yeah, for sure. I think um, growing up Asian American in America, I think there is a lot. I think you do do a lot of like the one of the common struggles is you're not Chinese enough for the Chinese when you go home or you go to your like, but. You're also not like American enough for the Americans. Um, so there's always that like, I like identity crisis, I think for like specifically like Chinese Americans or Asian Americans. Um, but I try not to think too hard about it because I, I used to be kind of obsessed, more obsessive with like the definition of authentic. But then as I, especially like in the last few years, the definition of authentic for, for me, and I think for most of Americans, is really just what your experience in America is. And my, my experience in America is authentic, and the food that I serve here is the authentic food of that experience. Right, of both those cultures right. and, and what so. came out of it, right? So tell us about the, the cashew chicken, because on the menu it says, it, yeah. there's no description, <laughs> it just says the authentic one. Um, so when, we were, when my business partner and I were writing the menu descriptions, um, it was just really hard to describe that dish because that is also another dish that I think in every Asian, every Asian country or every Asian cuisine, there's a version of that. And then there's also the um, American, the Americanized or the Chinese American version of cashew chicken as well. My favorite cashew chicken dish is um, the, Thai, the Thai version. Um, and it's a and cashew chicken is derivative of kung pao chicken, so it makes sense because also one of my favorite chicken dishes in Chinese food is kung pao chicken. Um, so it was really just kind of an inside joke because we didn't know how to describe the dish, and I was just like, just put the authentic one because no one's gonna know what that means because just like how I said earlier, everybody has their own interpretation of what authentic is. So if like. Everyone is going to be like the vanguard of authenticity sometimes. And so it's kind of a play towards that where it's like, we're, prob we're gonna probably disappoint like 90% of you by, because by naming it the authentic one, because you've had that version that is authentic to you, but this is the version that's authentic to me. This is the version that I ate like all the time in Thailand. It was like one of my go-to comfort foods. And it was the first Thai dish I learned how to cook um, when I left Thailand. Um, I lived in Thailand for a long time. So, <laughs> so when I left Thailand, it was one of the dishes that I missed a lot. And so it was one of the first dishes that I like really like learned how to cook too. So. so before we get to the last few questions, what's this item and how are those different from what we typically know of pot stickers? So these are impossible pot stickers. So they are treated almost exactly the same as your normal like pork and chive dumpling pot sticker, but instead of pork, we use impossible meat. So they are completely vegan. Oh, wow. um, and that is one of the more like truly authentic dishes where like the one thing about it is that it's a vegan pot sticker. And it is a, a 
quite like it does change a lot of people's minds on what they think of like um, like some alternative some meat product. Yeah. So. Yeah, my my mom's very uh, paranoid when it comes to uh, substitute materials because she thinks like everything is is fake meat is like made of plastic or something. So <laughs> I, I think I'm gonna have her try those when when she comes here. Awesome. And then what's this one? So that's our fat noodle short rib. Um, that is a dish that is probably authentic to this restaurant. Um, that is that flavor profile. That um, that flavor profile is derivative from a traditional Chinese or Taiwanese beef noodle soup, which is probably one of is probably considered the national one of the national dishes of Taiwan, um, which is where my mom is from. And so Taiwan beef noodle soup is like a very slow stewed um, like cut of, of like sui beef and with wheat noodles and like a rich five spice forward um, broth. And, I, and it is like the dish that I think of when I think of Taiwan or when I think of my mom, because she makes it for me still. Oh. It's like, it's like the food that my, it's like my mom's, it's my mom's love language is to make me Taiwanese beef noodle soup when I come home. Wow. So instead of having an actual bowl of beef noodle soup on the menu, we turned it into a stir fry noodle dish. So we made the sauce saucier. Um, we were using a dinosaur beef rib um, cut that we slow cooked for 24 hours uh, and like a fat wide cooked fresh wheat noodle that we stir fry in like a tomato and like black bean sauce. So. Oh, that's, so yeah, cause you can't, you can't give away your mom's original <laughs> recipe too easily, right? Well, I will just never be able to live up to that recipe. No. So that's, that is, you well, I'll just gotta own. change it a little. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so you, you mentioned a lot about, you know, the, how this is your, your second project. How has, uh, how has the development of Best Quality Daughter differ from say, Tanko Ramen or your time at Hot Joy, both are, Asian inspired restaurants, but also historic building adjacent. Uh, sure, so um, Hot Joy, I was the beginning of my cooking career. I had a day job before I went into the kitchen um, and then to horrify my Chinese mom, I quit my day job to become a fry <laughs> cook. Uh, <laughs> and my first job was in the Monterey in, in San Antonio and Quayle was the chef. And from there, the Hot Joy pop-up was born. And so I was much more of like, a, had a backseat role in that, where I was just like this like Asian girl that had some ideas that got to influence the menu some, but I was also just like an employee at Hot Joy, you know, and that, and that like, and it was, and I didn't really have that big, I didn't have that big of a footprint on Hot Joy. And then Tenko was my first, my first baby. And Tenko is like a fast casual ramen shop um, still at, at the Pearl and it's in a food hall and we're really proud of that. We do everything from scratch, all the broths and stuff, but it has such a small footprint in that building. It's because it's in a food hall. It's one of five other spaces. I think it's probably like 50 square feet. Um, and so we can't really have that big of a, of a footprint aesthetically on that. We did our, the best that we could. Um, and, and so the, for Best Quality Daughter, it's like my first full service restaurant that is like ours. And so I would definitely say that Best Quality Daughter has like more of a stamp on it, you know? It's like more, more of a, more of a our vibe. Like this really was like something that we built from the ground up from like concept up also. So do you guys have any, you know, dissonance at all about having a, an Asian American restaurant house out of like a, uh, a folk Victorian home that was built for Austrian German immigrants in 1906, or did you make it your own, or do you feel their yeah. familial energy in I, there? I think it's a great uh, testament to kind of the stories that buildings tell over time, you know, and it's I think it's a record of a culture of a place and that it could have been a homestead for a German family that's now an Asian American restaurant. I think all of those layers of history and culture are really interesting and make, I don't know, buildings the life of buildings all their own. Yeah, I agree. It also speaks to like the American experience. 
you know, yeah. everything blending together, right. right? But still having that distinctive stamp that you talked about. Right. Um, well, this has been a, a great meal. I'm glad to uh, to have a, a bite of each, and you know, I, I'm not gonna eat all of it on camera. <laughs> um, but uh, is there anything that either of you want to leave us off with? You know, in celebration of both Historic Preservation Month as well as Asian Pacific Heritage Month. Yeah, I think um, just remember that there are like people behind all of these spaces and to treat everyone with respect and um, especially now in like recent times, I think it's important that um, like recognize that we're all Americans and these are our spaces too and we, we are also creating spaces. So. Yeah, and I'll add that I think preservation doesn't have to be static and I think we've done a beautiful job respecting this this historic building and giving it a new interpretation and um, I think that that's what makes it interesting to kind of work with old buildings and, and yeah interpret something new. Well thank you guys so much for, for having me and for the hosting the Office of Historic Preservation on our episode of Historic Reservations. <laughs> uh, if you know of a place of, uh, of history of food culture in your own community reach out to us and uh, maybe you could book your own historic reservation.